Father God, we center our focus upon you. We fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Father God, thank you for another day on planet Earth. Thank you that we live and move and have our being in you, Jesus. Amen. And thank you for your Holy Spirit, uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit. We ask you to bless our service here today, Lord God. Um, encourage those that are downcast. Heal the sick. And speak to our hearts. And bless and anoint Pastor Dave as he brings forth the word and the worship team as they lead us into the throne. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Well, good morning, men. Good morning. We're in the book of 1 Samuel. We're in chapter 25. We've been looking at the... At the runaway years of David. In 1 Samuel chapter 25, we were introduced to a couple of characters. Uh, first of all, we realize Samuel dies. Samuel, the, the last of the judges, uh, one of the priests, if you will, a spiritual leader who um, was pressured by the people to inaugurate Saul into the position of king and yet went and anointed young David when he was still a boy, the spiritual backbone of the country, he dies. So as that happens, we see a man named Nabal, who's a very wealthy man. David and his men have done security for them. They've uh, been on the outside perimeters of their property and made sure that no uh, invading armies and uh, anybody would want to help themselves to Nabal's goods. Nabal's a very wealthy man. He has a wife named Abigail. And Nabal, his name means fool. I have no idea what his parents were thinking when they named him. <laughs> but uh, very often these things are reflexive. It's, uh, in other words, somebody, somebody gets a name and then they make their name famous by being a certain way and then suddenly that name means yes. this thing from now on. Uh -huh. uh, like, you know, I gotta go to the John. <laughs> <laughs> like one of those things. So, so here's Nabal, who's, it's a time of shearing when uh, the sheep are, are completely wooled up and they're gonna be taking the, the the wool off and it's a time of feasting it's in the fall typically and so this is a a really good feast time and David says listen guys why don't you run out there and see if he can spare some food for us because he's on the run he and 600 men on the run from Saul who's trying to kill him and he's thrown a spear at him several times and uh, luckily missed him so David's on the run Saul is jealous of him and so he just asked for uh, some food. And he says, whatever you could spare would be good. And he goes, well, who the heck are you? You're nobody to me. What, you want me to hand out food to everybody? You think I should give my food and drink to anybody that just shows up? Any servant that leaves their master? So he makes little of David and his request. And David, David said, oh, no, we're not going to have that. He's, we're gonna, I'll pick up the story. We'll get a running start from verse 12. And David's young men turned on their heels and went back. And they came and they told him these words. And David said to his men, Every man, gird on your sword. In other words, we're going to battle. So every man girded on his sword. And David also girded on his sword. You remember whose sword he has? Goliath. He's got Goliath's sword. So it's a big one. You can tell who's in charge, whoever has the biggest sword, I guess. <laughs> and about 400 men went with David, and 200 stayed with the supplies. Now one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Look, David sent messengers from the wilderness to greet our master, and he reviled them. But the men were not good, but the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, nor did we miss anything as long as they accom uh, we accompanied them. And then we were, when we were in the fields, they were a wall to us, both by night and by day, and all the time that we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do, for harm is determined against your master and against all his household. So they said, this is what he said to David. What verse are you in, brother? 
I'm going to pick it up from, uh, we're in verse 17. Of chapter 20. 25. <laughs> now, therefore, no one consider what you will do, for harm is determined against our master and against his household. They had absolutely no idea the extent of what was coming down. For he is such a scoundrel that no one can speak to him. So apparently this guy has a reputation not only with his wife, but with his employees, with his servants, that he's a scoundrel. There's no way you can talk to this guy. He's completely unapproachable. We talked about that last week. Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves of bread, two skins of wine, five sheep already dressed, five seats of roasted grain, 100 clusters of raisins, 200 cakes and figs, and loaded them on donkeys and said to her servants, go on before me, see, I am coming after you. And she did not tell her husband Nabal. So she hurry up and, and gets this catering gig going on and she gathers all of this. Now they're very wealthy, so she's got plenty of tools, okay? And she helps herself to all of these things and packs them up on donkeys and sends them on and says, listen, I'll be right behind you. Just, I, I don't want David showing up here with these guys and having a war. So why don't you hurry up and catch, you know, head in his direction and I'll catch up with you. So it was, as she rode on the donkey, that she went down under the cover of the hill. And there was David and his men coming down toward her. And she met them. Now David had said, surely in vain, I have protected all of this, all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belongs to him, and he has repaid me evil for good. May God do so and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. He's saying, I'm going to kill everybody. He doesn't, he doesn't want to take care of me? No problem. I'll kill them all. So, you get the idea you don't want to mess with David, right? Yeah. <laughs> he was a general for Saul, after all, and he enjoyed lots of victories, so he knows what he's doing. He's not just some kid anymore watching sheep. He's a full-grown man and a general. He also knows how to play a mean guitar. <laughs> Verse 23, now when Abigail saw David, notice what she does. She dismounted quickly from the donkey fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. And so she fell at his feet and said, first of all, she said volumes by her body language, right? Mm -hmm. She jumps off the donkey, she goes running to him and she falls down on her face before him like she's worshiping, okay? Mm -hmm. A complete position of humility, right? Yeah. Yeah. On me, Lord, let this iniquity B. And please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal. By the way, this is her husband she's referring to. You ever have your wife? No, never mind. <laughs> For as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and with folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men and my Lord whom you had sent. Now, therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from, every, from avenging yourself from your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm to my Lord be as Nabal. You see what she said? She says, I'm so glad I caught up with you and I stopped you from doing this impetuous thing from you avenging yourself. Because are we supposed to avenge ourselves? No. No. Throughout the scriptures we're told that. It says that we're not to take any vengeance, personal vengeance, that we're supposed to leave way for God's judgment, right? Yes, yes. And so she says, I'm so glad I caught you so that you didn't shed blood. You didn't have to, you know, do what you were planning on doing. So she's assuming that he's going to listen. That takes a lot of faith, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Kind of like when we pray. And now, this present which your maidservant has brought by, to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass 
of your maidservant. Do you see? She's taking personal responsibility for her husband and what he's done. And she says, let this judgment fall on me. Does this sound familiar to you? The innocent taking the fall for the guilty? Sounds like Jesus. Who took our sins upon the cross. Right? So she's being the very picture of who Jesus eventually will be. This is a very godly example. Taking the responsibility for her household, even though it was her husband who did the stupid thing. For the Lord will certainly make my Lord an enduring house, because my Lord fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. So she's basically saying, I know you're going to be the next king. You're going to be the guy who's going to rise up. And so you're doing everything right, and I stand with you. Yet a man has risen to pursue you and seek your life, but the life of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of the living with the Lord your God and the lives of the enemies he shall sling out as from the pocket of a sling. Isn't it interesting? She says that your life will be bound up in the bundle of the living. By the way, if you've ever seen a Norman Rockwell uh, painting, you know when he, he paints the, the little boy who's running away and he, he gets all of his treasured things and he puts them like in a handkerchief and then he ties them up and he puts them on a string and then he puts the, the you know, he puts the uh, stick over his shoulder and you can tell he's running away, you know, he's going to live a hobo life or whatever. That's the bundle of the living, by the way. It's what people used to do back in the, the old days to protect their things. Instead of putting it in a safe deposit box, they would wrap it up in a bundle and then they would hide it away. And so she's likening his life to be bound up in the things of God that are precious and important. And so she uses this language. And she says that his enemies will be bound up as in the pocket of a sling. She's bringing to remembrance his victory with Goliath. And saying that the rest of his, his uh, enemies will be just like that. And it shall come to pass when the Lord has done for my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you. And has appointed you ruler over Israel. That this will be no grief to you nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause or that, the, or that the Lord has avenged himself. You see, she says, you're going to be king someday and you don't want this blood on your hands. You don't want to be sorry later for, this, for the foolish thing you did by coming and killing an entire household because it wouldn't give you food. So I don't want to cause you grief by having to do this. And so she's being very gracious, right? I don't know if you guys have had an occasion to kill somebody, but it is something that will weigh on your conscience for the rest of your life. It's something, I'm not sure how these people that came out of Nuremberg at trials and were relocated and came into this country and were given separate names and all, I don't know how they live with themselves, but it did happen and the government actually brought bunches of people over um, because we were at war with Russia. And they, we wanted their smarts. So anyway, I digress. He says, I don't want you to do this and, and let the Lord avenge himself. Let the Lord take care of these things. But the Lord has dealt well with you, well, with my Lord. Then remember your maidservant. So she says, I'm doing you a favor and I want you to remember I'm doing you a favor. So when you get lifted up into a place of you know, political power and stuff, I want you to remember this day. And David said to Abigail, Blessed is the Lord God of Israel who sent you this day to meet me. And blessed is your advice and blessed are you because you have kept me this day from coming to bloodshed and from avenging myself with my own hand. It's a good thing not to avenge yourself. It is. As much as you might think it's going to make you feel better, it doesn't. And as much as you think somehow justice has been done, it's not. And even in the first century during Jesus' time, they thought that it was okay to do such a thing because there are scriptures, that, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You know that's in the Torah. It's in, the, it's in Leviticus, it's in Deuteronomy. But it's not given for personal vengeance. It's given for jurisdiction of judges to judge a thing. 
That if a thing has been stolen from you, that you're to be given back what was stolen, and then some, with interest. And so an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth was a guideline for judges, not for personal vengeance. But the people in the first century were taking it as personal vengeance. You know, you know, you 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 know, you turn around and jab me, I'm gonna jab you, you know, and, and we kind of think we're justified in doing so, but it just escalates, doesn't it? Yes, yes. Right. You know, somebody smacks you and then they then you punch them and then they get a knife and then you get a gun and then they get an anvil and then you get a piano. You know, like in the cartoons. <laughs> that's it. That's what it does. It just escalates. And so he says, "Thank you for thank you for stopping me." Verse thirty-four. For indeed, as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me back from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, surely by morning light no males would have been left to Nabal. So he had, he tells her, "I was planning on killing everybody, not just your husband, but every male." that's there, anybody who can take a sword and fight. So David received from her hand what she had brought to him and said to her, go up in peace to your house. See, I have heeded your voice and respected your person. So it wasn't just what she said, but it's who she was that he listened to. And it wasn't a bad idea that she was pretty good looking. We're told that here in the scriptures, that she was wise. It's a great combination, right? Yes. So, for all of you single guys, if you, want to, if you want to find a good woman, find a good woman who serves the Lord, who does the right thing despite what you might do in your anger. Just saying. I got one of those at home, but you can't have mine. Verse 36. Now Abigail went to Nabal, and there he was, holding a feast in his house, like the feast of a king. And Nabal's heart was merry within him because he was very drunk. So he's foolish in so many different ways, and this is one, he doesn't know when to stop. And he's overindulged, so he's drunk. Therefore, she told him nothing, little or much, until morning light. You know how smart it is not to talk to a drunk? Because they won't remember it anyway. And what they say, they'll be sorry for the next day. If somebody's drunk, somebody's out of control, somebody's stoned, as much as you feel like you want to unload something on them, it's not going to do any good. So don't. So you see, she's exercising wisdom in the face of his other foolishness, which is a drunk. So it was in the morning when the wine had gone from Nabal, I love that, that his wife had told him these things, and his heart died within him. And he became like a stone. You know what they might call that? A stroke. Thus says the Dr. Andrew. Thank you. Yes, a stroke. He has a stroke. He throws an embolism, whatever it is. And he becomes like a stone. In other words, he's paralyzed. He can't move. Then it happened after about 10 days that the Lord struck Nabal and he died. All it took was 10 days. Notice that the Lord took vengeance for him. And he didn't have to do anything. David didn't have to do anything. Man, if you're thinking about taking vengeance in your own hands and you're going to give it to somebody or you're going to try to teach somebody a lesson, don't. Pray for them. Scripture says we should pray for our enemies. Pray for your enemies. And those who despitefully use you. Because then you will be like your Father in heaven. Isn't that amazing? Yes, yes. Difficult thing to do, though, isn't it? Yeah, sure. It's hard enough for me to pray for the people I'm related to. <laughs> and my friends, and those people that I like, usually. And then I have to pray for my enemies? Well, sometimes your enemies are your relatives. Sometimes your enemies are those who are close to you. So pray for them. Verse 39. So David heard that Nabal was dead. And he said, Blessed be the Lord! <laughs> who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal and he has kept his servant from evil for the Lord had returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head you see David sees this as the hand of God and he's glad that God's involved and he didn't have to do it isn't it nice when there are people who stand against you and they've set themselves up 
and you withheld yourself from firing at them when you can and taking them out when you can and you have the ability to and the strength to it doesn't mean you're a wimp it means that you love God more than you care about getting your own cheap vengeance and the Lord takes care of it I, I got a whole book full of stories of when the Lord's done such things and he will and he has and David sent and he proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife now how many of you know how many wives he has at this point in time he's got one remember her name Michal and Michal is the daughter of Saul who's staying in the palace with her daddy right now and he's on the run isn't he she didn't go with him Saul does a sneaky thing he gives her away to somebody else that's all happening behind the scenes we're not told right yet so David says you know here's a woman who's now a widow and a widow doesn't inherit land and stuff I mean you don't get anything it goes to the next male in the family so she's about to lose everything and be forced to marry this guy's brother who might be just as foolish so he sees an opportunity and he swoops in he's a good looking girl she's wise and she's a servant David sent and he proposed to Abigail to take her as his wife and then the servants of David had come to Abigail at Carmel and spoke to her saying David sent us to you to ask you to become his wife and you thought they only did this in school go tell so and so I like her tell me what she says you guys never did that right you were always bold as a lion and walked up and said I like you when you were seven ah you guys <laughs> then she rose she bowed her face to the earth and said here is your maid servant a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord this woman told these men as she got down on the ground and bowed before them in humility I'm here I'm here to serve not just David but you guys as well now there's a woman my woman if, if my wife were to show up and say I'm here for you honey I love you but I want to serve all these men wouldn't you think that guy's got one heck of a wife <laughs> who, wouldn't, who wouldn't want a woman like that not just willing to serve her husband but willing to serve everybody that follows him that's 600 men that's a pretty ambitious woman right so Abigail rose in haste and rode on a donkey attended by five of her maidens so she's ready for the ceremony and she followed the messengers of David and became his wife verse 43 David did also to a Hinnom of Jezreel and so both of them were his wives now this is the verse I point to when I'm arguing with my wife <laughs> and I tell her there's really no prohibition against having more than one wife <laughs> I, no no I don't ever do that I, that's, that's bad news by the way he's he's breaking the scriptures the kings were not to multiply wives you can find that both in Deuteronomy and Leviticus these guys were not to multiply wives and so you got to take a look at this and say why in the world is he doing this we see what the father does to moderation that the son does to excess David takes himself uh, at least up to five wives that I can name what happens with his son Solomon he's got a thousand women under his roof he's taking care of some of many of them uh, foreign wives from all the other nations and they make him build temples to their gods and he ends up worshiping their gods takes his heart away from the Lord later so it's bad news that's why in Ecclesiastes wrote you know I can find one good man in 10,000 uh, or one man in a thousand I can find a good man but he says I haven't found a good woman yet even in 10,000 women he's looking in all the wrong places 
marrying all these foreign women who worship other gods. He did it for political reasons. So David takes this really great woman, Abigail, and he also marries a Hinoan of Jezreel. So they're both his wives as he's on the run, and they're traveling with him. Yes? You know what? David also, when he married to uh, Saul's daughter, she messed up, and, and God said she couldn't have any kids. So she, was, she wasn't going to reproduce for him anyway. That's right. She was cursed because she, she mocked him. When he was dancing before the Lord. Yeah, that's that's a little bit later on, but you're right. Oh, that's coming up. I they haven't brought the ark. They haven't brought the ark. Exactly. That's when he's king. But that's okay. It's good. A little spoiler alert. There you go. <laughs> Verse 44. But Saul had given Michal his daughter, David's wife, to Pauti, the son of Laish, who was in Galim. So he's already lost his wife back home because Saul took his. He tried to saddle saddle her up on David to mess with him. If you remember that. She goes, well, I sent him out on all these courageous things and you know what? He still lives. So the armies didn't kill him. Maybe my daughter will. Mm -hmm. Which tells you what a high esteem he has of his own daughter. Chapter 26. So now we... Yes. So now David's wife <coughs> was given to healthy son of Laish, who was from Gala, yes. Yeah, and? Right. So as long as I put Kel, his first wife was given away. Yep, Saul gave her away. David's gone and he's on the run. He's running from Saul. And Saul says, you're done with him. You're going to marry who I tell you to marry. So this is by Saul's request that she's... That's right. Okay. Saul gave her away. Wasn't of her own doing. She loved David. But he hasn't been around. He's abandoned her. Yes? Is that considered a divorce? Uh, no, it's not considered a divorce, not officially. In fact, as far as God's concerned, if, if, it's not, if it's not done for the reason of adultery, it's not really divorce. Just say, eh, we don't love each other anymore. As far as God's concerned, you're still married. And you're supposed to get a letter of uh, written of divorce, too, are not Well, in the, in the Law of Moses, yeah, there's supposed to be a certificate, and it's supposed to be endorsed. So it's not something you just declare. Although the rabbis thought... If you just said it three times within the hearing of witnesses, that, that it was binding. Isn't that something that Moses Which isn't scriptural, by the way. Isn't that something that Moses just did because he couldn't handle the pressure anymore? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, Moses gave you a writ of divorce because of the hardness of your hearts, but from the beginning it was not that way. He says, haven't you read? It was, it, it was Adam and Eve. He gave one of each. He didn't create Adam and, you know, and a thousand women, he, he created Adam and Eve, one and one. That's what God's intent was. And marriage wasn't supposed to end in divorce, it's supposed to end in death. Which might feel that way, but anyway. <laughs> Chapter 26. Now the Ziphites came to Saul at Gibeah saying, Is David not hiding in the hill of Helka, opposite of Jeshimon? In other words... They're telling on him. And these are the same people that told two chapters ago. Hey, it is, isn't he hiding out in this, this cave? So th these are the tattletale people, the Ziphites. And then Saul arose and he went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having 3,000 chosen men of Israel with him. By the way, does that seem like overkill to you? <laughs> zip her up the mouth. I'm going up. I'm going up. Yeah, they should zip it. You're right. They're going up, they're going up against 600 men, and so he takes 3,000. You get the idea he's a little, he's trying to make up for something. Anyway. To seek David in the wilderness of Ziph, and Saul encamped in the hill of Hilka, uh, Hakela, which is opposite Jeshimon, on the road. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul had came after him in the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul had indeed come. <coughs> Excuse me. So David arose, and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, by the way, that, that's the commander of the army. And now Saul lay within the camp, with the people encamped all around him. And David answered and said to Ahimelech the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zer Zeruiah, brother of Joab, saying, Will you go down with me to Saul in the camp? Huh. 
Okay, here's the deal. Saul shows up. He sets up camp. David's with his men. Saul is in the middle of a camp of 3,000 men. They go to sleep at night. David taps on a couple of guys and he says, Hey, you want to go down with me? We'll go, we'll go get Saul. In the middle of 3,000 men. You just want to take a couple of us and kind of make it look surreptitious sort of uh, entry in the evening, really? Is that what you want to do? How many of you would say, sure? There's only 3,000 men. We've got to tiptoe between their bodies and get to Saul before we do whatever it is you want to intend. Mm -hmm. but this is the guy who went before Goliath, though. He knows the Lord's in charge here. Yes, he does. But what's he going to do? We're not told. Uh -huh. Because two chapters ago, in 24, he had an opportunity to take him out, and he didn't. And he said, I won't touch the Lord's anointed, right? Mm -hmm. Now it seems like he's scheming to go take, take care of Saul, like he's had enough. And who knows? He does snap occasionally, like with Nabal. <laughs> so Abishai said, I'll go down with you. And that, that's a good friend right there. Who will walk into 3,000 men to, to take out your enemy. That's a good friend. So David and Abishai came to the people by night. And there Saul lay sleeping within the camp. So he was in the middle of the camp. With a spear stuck in the ground by his head. By the way, it's probably the same spear that he tried to kill David with three times. And he ended up throwing it at his son one time. So Saul is a man of the spear, okay? So if you want to know where Saul is, just look for the spear stuck in the ground. And that's where Saul is, because that's his chosen weapon. Stuck in the ground by his head. It's just a slight maneuver to lift it and jam it through the temple and it's it. Right? Done deal. And Abner and the people lay all around him. By the way, Abner's the general. He's his uh, chief of staff. <clears throat> then Abishai said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with the spear right to the earth. I will not have to strike him a second time. You get the idea that these, these guys have fought before. I'll take this spear, I'll jam it right through his skull, and I won't have to do it a second time. It's not going to be like, he's not dead yet. You know, it's going to be once. You can trust me, I'll take care of this. I'll, I'll take him out real good for you. Verse 9, but David said to Abishai, do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed? You see, David has a respect for God's position of authority. You may not respect the man, but you've got to respect the position. Yes. And he says, this is the Lord's anointed. Now, doesn't mean that he's full of the Spirit of God or he's doing anything right, but he is the man who's in the position of authority. And you need to respect that position, even if you don't respect the person. He says, who can lift his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him on his day. On his day he shall die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. It seems like David's lapse of judgment previously with wanting to kill Abigail's husband has been cured. And he just won't kill this guy. Although, if, if this guy won't give food, he goes and tries to kill Nabal and all of his family is going to kill him all. So he has a respect for authority, and that's a good thing. But please, take now the spear and this jug of water that are by his head and let us go. So David took the spear and the jug of water by Saul's head, and they got away. And no man saw or knew it or awoke. So they sneak in, they have an opportunity to kill Saul. They don't. They just take his spear, which is his favorite weapon, and a jug of water, which is probably uh, right there by his head as well. And they do all of this without anybody being on guard duty, without anybody watching, without anybody waking. For they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen on them. You see how God provides? 
Did he talk about a little wine too? Well, he kept them asleep, and it says the Lord did that, so we don't know it was any extra instrument, but he kept them asleep. Now David went over to the other side, and he stooped on the top of the hill afar off, at a great distance, being between them. And David called out to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Do you not answer, Abner? So he's yelling out to the general. Usually the general of the army has got to be the biggest dude. You know, there's nobody messing with him. Okay, so he's calling out Abner. He's not even calling out Saul. Because who's responsible for Saul's well-being? Abner. Abner, primarily, right? So he calls out to him like the Lord calls out to Adam in the garden. And Abner answered and said, Who are you calling out to the king? So David said to Abner, Are you not a man? Actually, if you look in the original King James, Are you not a valiant man? Aren't you a manly man? Aren't, what kind of man are you? This is what he's saying. And who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not guarded your Lord the King? For one of the people came in to destroy your Lord the King. This thing that you have done is not good. It's interesting. <coughs> David blames him for the success of his mission. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the second time now. The, the second time they did protect the king. Well, the first time, he was going into a cave to relieve himself. You don't want your general going with you. I don't usually ask guys going to the bathroom with me either. So it's a good habit. But you're right. It is his responsibility. And so he calls him out. And he holds him responsible. So there's definite accountability here. As the Lord lives, you deserve to die because you have not guarded your master, the Lord's anointed. It's interesting. He seems to be very concerned with Saul's protection. Think about it. Who's going to be king next? If you want your people to have a respect for the position, you need to respect the position before you get it. If you go talking your boss down to your fellow workers and you become the next boss, you've just set a very dangerous precedent. Especially if they carry spears. And now, see where the king's spear is and the jug of water that was by his head. Of course, they check, and it's gone. Then Saul knew it was David's voice and said, Is that your voice, my son David? Notice the term of affection, the guy he's trying to kill. David said, It is my voice, my Lord. Notice the term of respect. O king. And he said, Why does my Lord thus pursue his servant? He's referring to himself as the servant. Because he's not after Saul. For what, for what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If the Lord has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the if it is the children of men, may they be cursed before the Lord, for they have driven me out this day from sharing the inheritance of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. How many of you are confused by that? Three of you. Okay, good. The rest of you explain that to him. He's basically saying, if you and I have a problem, we can, we can take care of this. We can go to the temple, we'll make a sacrifice to God, we'll make a peace offering. We can, we can make it right. If there's something I've done, I can go and ask forgiveness of God, make a sacrifice, rectify things with you. We can patch this up. But if you've got a problem with me and there's no real problem, then the Lord's on your tail. And you have forced me out of Israel, which is the inheritance of the people of God, and basically forced me to go live with the Philistines, these non-God honoring people. That's essentially what he said. It's the Jersey version. Mm -hmm. That's understandable? Yes. Okay, okay. You probably understood it first. But. Verse 20. So now, do not let my blood fall to the earth before the face of the Lord, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. He goes, you brought 3,000 guys. You looking for me? I'm nobody. You bring 3,000 3, men to come up against, I, I have 600, and you're coming up against me, I'm nobody. He referred to himself as a flea before, remember? When he talked to him after the, the cave. 
And then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will harm you no more, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Indeed, I have played the fool and erred exceedingly. Well, it sounds like everything's fine. It sounds like everything's fine, but he's done this before. He said, listen, David, I'm sorry, I was wrong. I shouldn't have done it. I'll leave you alone. Just come home and everything's fine. Well, he's done that and he tried to kill him three times. So what happens when you find an unfaithful person that makes a deep attestation of humility? Hold them at arm's distance, yeah. Hey, listen, I got nothing against you. I'm not gonna to try to kill you, but uh, you know, I'm gonna keep my distance. You find somebody who's given to uh, rash decisions like trying to kill you after they said they wouldn't? You know, you can forgive somebody without trusting them. Well, I think you forgive and forget, but you don't bring them into a close proximity of your trust. If, somebody, if, if somebody's a gossip, listen, I'll forgive you, but I'm not going to tell you any more deep secrets. You know, I'm, I, I, every time I loan you something, uh, I never get it back. I'll forgive you for the stuff that you, you haven't given back, but uh, don't ask me to lend you anything else. So I think you can forgive somebody without trusting them. And I think that's an important delineation. Most people think, well, you just forgive and you forget, and so you just continue to do the same thing over and over and over and over and over, and you're a complete sap. Mm -hmm. Well, that's foolishness. Mm -hmm. You can forgive somebody, I just, you're not trustworthy. I mean, I won't hurt you or try to take it back or take vengeance on you, but I won't trust you until you prove that, right? Trust is something that's earned. Mm -hmm. Forgiveness is something that's deserved because the Lord tells us to. But trust is something that has to be earned. Verse 22, and David answered and said, here is the king's spear. Let one of your young men come over and get it. In other words, David's not going to go over there and hand it to him. So there's a level of trust that's just not there. May the Lord repay every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord delivered you into my hand today, but I would not stretch out my hand against the Lord's anointed. And indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord. You see, he says, I have valued your life today. What I want is for the Lord to value my life. He doesn't say, Saul, I want you to value my life. You see, he's not doing this for Saul. He's not doing it for Saul's favor. He's doing it for the Lord. An audience of one. Which is the best reason we can do anything. It's not for the approval of somebody else, but for God's approval, because he's the one who sees all the time anyway. So indeed, as your life was valued much this day in my eyes, so let my life be valued much in the eyes of the Lord, and let him deliver me out of tribulation. So Saul said to David, may you be blessed, my son David. You shall both do great things and also still prevail. So David went on his way, and Saul returned to his place. So we're going to leave it right there for today. We've got a couple of minutes, but we're going to leave it there. We're going to start 27 next week. We're going to see David goes over into the army of the Philistines. This is, this is a backsliding period for David. Although there's some interesting lessons that he learns while he's over there. and We'll talk about that next week. Just to give you an idea, the beginning of 27 says, after David's great victory with Saul, after everything is great and it seems like Saul's going to leave alone, Saul goes home, everything's going well. This is what the, next, the very next verse says. And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in any part of Israel. What? He has this great victory, and after the victory, he seeps into a depression. You guys ever have this happen? You have a wonderful time, a great victory, and all of a sudden you slip into a depression. Or you exert a, a lot of energy to get something done and accomplish something, and then you fall into this sort of listless, listlessness. 
It happened to Elijah, if you remember, as he went to the altar and, and called on God, and God brought the, the fire from heaven and consumed the sacrifice, and he took the heads of all the Baal worshippers off, and it was a great day. And then Jezebel, with one threat, sends him running into the wilderness. So I find it a thing, when you think that you're on top of the, the hill, be careful, because there very well could be a, a depression on the other side of the hill. And David falls into this self-seeking, woe is me, Eeyore spirit later. Uh, I know he's going to catch me and kill me one day. It's inevitable. Where did his faith go? It evaporated. What happened to his memory? His memory of God delivering him. And he could have taken his life, and he didn't. And so what's he say? The best thing I could do is just run as fast as I can into the camp of the enemy. But guess what town he goes to? Gath. Guess who's from Gath? Goliath. Goliath the guy he killed. He's and now he's going to go to the very enemy's camp and try to make friends with them. And he brings his sword with him. He not only brings the sword with him, but he brings 600 men, so it's a small army. Why? Well, you guys read on ahead, and we'll talk about that next week. But he has this great victory. He ends up getting married. He, he now has two wives out in the wilderness as he's running to and fro. And uh, we know Abigail is definitely a woman of character. Uh, we don't say much about a Hindu one, but... What, what I learned from this is, you know, it's best to trust the Lord instead of the strength of your own hand. And if you think that your strength is only in your ability to do, you're going to be very disappointed. It won't be long until you fall into a depression <laughs> and you backslide because you're not trusting in the Lord. And it's just that quick. And it can happen to any one of us. It's happened to me. I mean, I, I, I got volumes of stories, but I will spare you. Let's pray. Father, this morning we want to commit ourselves to you, mind and body and soul, and pray that you might help us to do that which is right before you. We wouldn't have our eyes upon ourselves that we would look beyond ourselves to you. For you're the one who gives wisdom and you're the one who gives us strength and you're the one who gives us direction. We pray that you might watch over us, Lord, and give us protection, but you might also provide for us. Help us not to take vengeance for ourselves. Help us not to do it in word or in deed. I pray that you'd help us that our heart would trust in you and that we would leave vengeance to you. I thank you, Lord, for these stories that have been preserved over the years for us to read so that we might learn. Help us to be made more into your image that we might look and behave more like Jesus Christ. We pray that you help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.